Hey, everybody. Uh, congratulations. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, you probably just took the LSAT today. So I'm really excited to be here with you and help you figure out next steps, help you talk through and analyze what's going on, what's going on for you, how the exam went. And we're going to talk about how to maximize your chances of success on a retake, uh, deciding whether to cancel, deciding whether to retake, what to do while waiting for your score, and how to make the best use of today's exam results when you get your score back in a few weeks. So today, we're going to talk about all of those things. We're not going to talk about specific LSAT exam content because LSAC does not permit that, and they wouldn't be happy with us if we did. So we're going to steer clear of specific exam content. But we are going to talk about all those other things and much more. So if something, something went well or poorly on your LSAT exam and you're not sure what to make of it or how to handle it, just type in the chat box and we can go over it together. Um, excited to hear from you all how it went. Um, got one here from a student. Uh, this person uh, wanted to remain anonymous. Something bad happened on the LSAT this morning. I am deaf and wear hearing aids. My hearing is not 100% normal even with the aids. I couldn't hear the proctor say pencils down at the end of the fourth section. So they gave me a misconduct ticket and sent it to LSAC. What would you suggest I do? Get a letter from my doctor. Are there forms to be filled out? The proctor said they will cancel my score. Well, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that. That sounds like a terrible test day experience. What you could do now, uh, get a letter from the doctor. Call LSAC ASAP on Monday morning. In the meantime, you could email them. If you try calling them, you might just get a receptionist who's not able to tell you very much. In these situations, LSAC typically investigates and takes a few weeks to get back to you. So as frustrating as this is, just sit tight. In the future, you might want to consider seeking an accommodation. That's what LSAC typically recommends for anyone who has any sort of issue. Or at the very least, you could tell the proctor beforehand so they can make sure that you know when the section is ending. Obviously, that doesn't help you for today's exam, but it can help you prepare for next time. So I wish you all the best. Um, good luck to you on that one. Uh, got one here from Jamie. Overall, I thought the exam went okay. It was definitely the most relaxed and most prepared I felt. Unfortunately, I did not get through the last reading comp passage. Felt pretty confident about the others, but did not get through the last. I had three LR sections, so one was clearly the, clearly the experimental, et cetera, et cetera. I considered canceling my score. I think there's a possibility I hit the 165 mark, so we'll see. Definitely don't think I hit the high 160s, 170s, but didn't necessarily go entirely bad either. My testing center also had no AC and instead had really loud fans which wasn't necessarily ideal. So a lot to unpack there, Jamie. Thanks for writing in. Uh, so first of all, the no AC, loud fans, that's awful. I wish they didn't do that. In the future, just try to Google for test center reviews and see if you can get any sense of what the rooms will be like, although obviously this sort of thing is somewhat tough to predict. I mean, the major issue you described really was that you, know, you maybe you didn't get through the last RC section the passage, the other ones, you know, mostly seem to have gone okay from what you wrote to me. So I would say don't cancel. If you think there's even a chance you got a 165 and you were hoping for higher, maybe you got a few points higher. It's really hard to get a sense of exactly how you did when you have all the adrenaline and emotions and stress of having the real test day experience. So if you have any doubt and you don't get the sense that it went disastrously, then I would suggest keep the score. There's really no downside to having multiple scores on your record. And even if you have a lower and a higher or a higher followed by a lower, doesn't really matter. Schools do not average multiple scores. That was the case over 10 years ago. It's not the case now, but there's still a lot of misinformation and mythology as this idea keeps getting propagated when it's not really the case anymore. So sounds like you had a pretty good experience overall aside from the fans. Let's see, you got one here from Elizabeth. When do scores become available? Scores become available in a few weeks. The specific date is posted on LSAC's website, but typically it's two, three, two to three weeks afterwards. 
in years past, LSAC actually would kind of you know, randomize it where sometimes they'd release it one day before the scheduled release date. Other times they would release it three days before or even more. So it was kind of unpredictable and put students in this position where you never really knew when it was going to come. So you just refresh your email constantly over the course of a week leading up to the exam score, the score release date. So that is no longer the case. Uh, LSAC has a new president now, and she has been looking to make more student-friendly policies, possibly to compete with the GRE or possibly just to modernize themselves. But either way, they are now publicizing the fact that they release scores on the scheduled date. Typically, they go out in the afternoon. Uh, typically, things will go gray on your LSAC account, which is an indication that something is happening and the scores will get released soon. So be on the lookout for that, but chances are it'll happen on the scheduled score release date. So not a lot of ambiguity there. They'll probably confirm it over Twitter or something sometime between now and then. In the meantime, what can you do? Well, if you're planning to retake, obviously just keep studying. If you're unsure of how it went, of course, Studying in the meantime is the safer option because at this point, the next LSAT is only just a few months away. And so if you wait these two to three weeks and just relax, you're losing valuable study time. So as frustrating as that might be, it's probably in your best interest to study at least to some extent on the an error on the side of caution that you will be retaking just a few months from now. So that is one thing to keep in mind. If you're confident that it went well, then that's great. You could focus on your application. You could focus on your personal statement, getting your letters of recommendation together. So that could be a, a useful way to spend the time. You know, the best personal statements are not written in one night. They're written over the course of weeks or even months so that you have the opportunity to work on revising it and getting multiple people looking at it, giving you ideas, et cetera. So, it could be a really useful way to spend that time. Of course, you deserve to take a few days off. You've been studying hard. So take this weekend at the very least to do nothing LSAT or law school admissions related and just relax. You owe it to yourself. You deserve it. You put in a lot of hard work and hopefully it's paid off. But either way, you can afford to take a few days off or even four to five days if your exam's a few months away. You have plenty of time and you don't want to get burned out. Certainly don't do any LSAT studying this weekend. Uh, Anna Janine writes, all I know was that I was so mentally exhausted after it was done that I could barely remember my own name. Well, that's why they have you fill out your name first. So you can relax now. There's a reason they put the writing sample last. And I don't know if any of you had your brains fried at that point. I certainly did when I took the LSAT. And law schools are not necessarily looking to evaluate your writing for how wonderful it is, like you know, a term paper or a personal statement. The writing sample is just there to partially give law school, LSAC, the claim that they do evaluate writing ability, even though it's not scored, but also because that way they can measure your personal statement against your writing sample if there is any ambiguity as to your English proficiency level or as to whether you just wrote your personal statement yourself. Obviously, if there's a severe difference in quality between the two, they'll have a sense that something is fishy. Got one here from Shannon, you know, with logical reason, I walked out of the test feeling nervous because I ran out of time on these sections and had to guess a lot at the end. Then saw on results that all the questions I mentioned were 19 or I missed, I missed where it seemed to be more from 19 or later. So it was frustrating that I had difficulty with the ones later. You know, first of all, you know, Shannon, that's, that's pretty typical you know, logical reasoning is in a general order of difficulty. So the fact that they came later, that they were more difficult is not really that much of a surprise. There's also, of course, the fatigue aspect to consider. Want to get your thoughts. I plan on retaking. Obviously, time is the biggest issue for me. Want to get your ideas on the best way to shape my studying so I can really speed up and have extra time instead of running out. So time on LR as you're studying for a retake. That's a great question. That's a big one. It's useful to be thinking about right now. So you know you're studying for a retake. You know that pacing was an issue. So what do you want to do? Well, first of all, you want to do lots of timed LR sections. And you want to focus on getting faster 
at your time.lar. So maybe you're aiming to do the first 10 questions in 10 to 12 minutes. You build up that time bank so that you have more time available for the tougher questions that are coming later. That way you're not gonna run out of time at number 19, or you're not going to have not you know, less than adequate time to handle the toughest questions of all. So learn to speed through the easy ones so you have time for the more tough ones. You, know, you said you were shooting for 167 to 170. At that point, you wanna be completing all questions and have a time bank built up so that those three to five questions that come later, that come towards the end that you have difficulty with that you're not sure of, you can have a second look and spend a few more minutes hammering away at each of those if possible. One of the things that often happens with students on tough questions, LR in particular, is they get bogged down and they get stuck in seeing the question a certain way, in analyzing that question's method of reasoning a certain way. So by coming back to it later and using that time bank you've built up, you can come back to those tough LR questions and you'll have broken out of your previous way of analyzing it, your previous perspective, because you've gotten some distance. You've done a few more questions between your two attempts at that tough one. So you can break out of that one mindset and one perspective and have a new look at it. So Shannon's got another one here I'll answer, but yeah, guys, feel free to keep them, keep them coming. Uh, getting faster, um, secondly, because I'm retaking, Will waiting until I get my November results to apply hurt my chances at admission? I think we might have talked about this before. Uh, uh, Shannon's one of my students. Um, with my LSAT score plus a 3.8 GPA, I think I could get into some good schools. I really want to be at a top 15. And I, I'm not sure about this, but I've read that early applications don't matter that much and it hurts you to apply later. So some conflicting stuff there. Um, does applying early matter or does it hurt to apply later or is it okay to retake it in November or a later test date? Um, first of all, applying early matters much less than it used to. So what that means is that if you retake later in the fall, into the winter, into the spring, that's fine. Most law schools are taking late winter and early spring scores, whether it's February, March, whatever it is, they are deferring and delaying more and more students. They're waitlisting more and more students. So if you postpone your test date or you retake, that's not a big deal. They are waiting to see who else will come along because there has been a significant drop in the number of test takers in, and applicants in recent years. So law schools even if you got a 165 and their median is 167, 168, they might just wait to see who else comes along and rather than say no. And if no one else comes along, they might take you. Or if you apply with a score that's great, they still might, or even better, they might still defer and delay just to see. They're taking a risk, but at the same time, they know that more students are retaking. So if you got a 167 now, you get a 172 later, that's totally fine they will be happy to wait on your 167 to see that 172 come along later. So you don't really need to worry very much about applying early. If you took this exam, it didn't go great for you. There is still the next one. And there are also further opportunities beyond that. So however today's test went for you, if you're thinking of retaking, just think of this one like a practice run. That's all it was. They don't average multiple scores anymore. So there's no reason to worry about that. Just Move on, study more for the next time, work on your applications, and you'll be totally fine. Alex says, I had three LR sections, so one was the experimental. The first LR section had a notably large amount of questions in the two-speaker format, whether they are point of disagreement or not. The first section felt the toughest because I was either feeling pressured or it was a bit harder than usual. RC was pretty easy, LG, I didn't find any surprises. All my performance really hinges on how I did on the LR sections. How do law schools look at students with four attempts under the new rule? Is it worth studying for another one? Should I continue prepping since I won't receive my score for a few weeks? Well, first of all, students with four attempts under the new rule. Well, first of all, the new rule is that there is no restriction on the number of times you can take the LSAT. They removed 
the limit of taking it three times within a two year period. So if you apply with four attempts, doesn't really matter that much. Certainly more than four really starts to look fishy, just like multiple cancellations might start to look a little bit flaky, which is another reason not to necessarily cancel. You could apply with four, totally fine. If you didn't do as well as you would have liked, yeah, you could study for another one. That's not the end of the world. Again, if you still haven't gotten a score that's at or close to your school's median and your GPA is not stellar, then it might be worth it. Obviously, it always depends on the specifics of the case. But yeah, next few weeks, definitely continue prepping if there's any ambiguity there. So got one person asking, I will be traveling internationally when the scores are released and I'm considering not looking until I return from my trip in case it didn't go as well as I would have hoped. Yeah, so whether to look until you get home. Yeah, interesting question. I mean, there's pros and cons to each one. Obviously, if it wasn't great, you want to enjoy your vacation and getting a, a less than ideal score is going to ruin that for you. Then of course, wait, don't look. On the other hand, if you're just a little bit, least bit curious and you want to see how you did and how it went, then yeah, look, not the end of the world either way. You can always retake. You can always shoot for the next time. So yeah, that's 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 my take on it really. I don't really have a specific answer for you one way or the other. Got a question about how to make the best use of today's exam results. So let's say that you get your score back. You, you have a, re a published released exam. So they give you the PDFs of the exam and you can look at all the questions you got wrong. Here's the thing about analyzing these results. Yes, there is just one question. There's just one exam, really. You have a sample size of one exam, 100 questions, one score, one data point. Let's say you got a 165 and you got, I don't know, 15, 20 questions wrong, something in that ballpark. And you had even a, a bit more that you were unsure of but or guessed, but you still got lucky and got it right. What do you do in that situation? Well, first of all, remember, it is just one exam. It's not a large sample size. Yes, it has certainly slightly higher validity because it is a real exam that you took under proctored conditions. But at the same time, it's not really enough to make any sort of judgment on. Let's say any given exam might have a handful of sufficient assumption questions, might have a half dozen necessary assumption or flaw questions, and you got a couple of each wrong. It's not that many questions. And some games show up on one exam, but not another. Certain tough reading comp topics might show up once in a blue moon. And so the fact that you did especially well or poorly on questions of those types might simply be based on the fact that there were those specific ones. You have a much better indication of your true score and where you stand if you have a larger set of questions. If you have three exams, five exams, 10 exams, and you analyze your results on all of those, then that'll be a much better, that'll put you in a much better position to analyze where you stand and what your weak areas are. Weak areas are not always just the questions you get wrong. They're also the ones that you get right, but have difficulty with the ones that you got right, but could have answered more efficiently. And so analyzing this exam a few weeks from now, you might not remember all the details of where your mind was at. Unlike when you do a practice exam at home or on your own, and then you are able to look at that specific exam and review it the, that same day or the following day when you remember all the specifics of your situation and where your mind was at and where you were at in terms of how you slept, what else is going on in your life, other distractions that might impact your score in one way or another. So today's exam results, useful, even if you take the exam and it's unreleased by LSAT because they want to reuse it or something, then it doesn't really matter too much. This exam is just one data point out of all the timed practice exams that you've taken. And you want to analyze or average the five most recent or so to give yourself the best chance of where you stand. So great questions. Keep them coming. I uh, got one here. 
I had three LR today, any way of telling which one was the experimental? Great question. So in years past, it was the case that LSAC would always make the, the experimental section one of the first three out of the five that you do that, that are LSAC content. That has changed in recent years. Now they only, they, they make the experimental any one of the five. So any one of the five could be the experimental, it could be the first, could be the last, could be the third. We don't know. Now, a lot of times people will discuss you know, content on message boards and forums and they will ID the details of, the, of all sections. And so I recommend going on one of the message boards or forums in order to get a sense of what was real. People will, with really good memories, will analyze all of that. So I, you know, they're probably pretty active on test day release, test days and also score, score release date. So check out the forums for all the details on that. That's not what this conversation is for, but check it out there. Uh, Joy asks, how to improve reading comprehension? Uh, really general question. Uh, I can't, you know, certainly, you know, summarize all of reading comp in just this brief conversation here. I have a whole course about that and other materials as well. Um, if you get more specific on that, then I can certainly you know, dive deeper into reading comp. Uh, one thing I'll say about reading comp in terms of timing is that when you're under test day timed conditions, I would typically recommend spending two and a half at most three minutes on the initial passage so that you have enough time for the question. So if you're running out of time on reading comp questions, or you're, um, yeah, I'll stop, I'll stop there for now on the timing. You might also consider for dual passages doing the question, the, the questions devoted to one specific passage first, rather than reading both passages and then cluttering your head with what happens on one versus the other. Obviously that's a random anecdote that just popped, you know, tidbit that just popped into my head. So. I'll leave off there for now. Uh, Priya asks, I'm going to take my first timed prep test tomorrow. Should I complete four or five sections? Uh, doesn't matter too much. I would say typically start with four, then work up to five just so that you're building your endurance bit by bit. Obviously, timed sections are tough to do in general. And if you're doing four, I would still do have give yourself a break between the second and third sections just so that you are not putting yourself through too much. Obviously doing four sections in a row is totally going to fry your brain beyond what you'll even experience on test day. So for that reason, I would recommend just doing two or three back-to-back -back timed, then taking a break and doing others. So you could do two, break, two more. You could do three, break, one. And then of course, three, break, two. And if you really wanna go crazy to build up your endurance, some at some point down the line, you could do three break three, because doing if you could do six sections, then you could certainly do five. So I would say, don't put yourself through too much. Take plenty of breaks. Don't do timed exams on back to back days because that leads to burnout. But other than that, have at it. You, I wouldn't do more than three timed exams a week, but you could certainly do two in a week or three here and there if you're taking the LSAT a few months from now you have plenty of time to work on those exams. I'd say you're probably having taken 10 timed exams under strict, realistic test day conditions. That's, that's enough. Some people do more and of course there's benefit, but the real benefit to doing a timed exam comes from analog, you're the post game analysis, not only just what was your score, but the experience of, of timing yourself in those real test day like conditions being very strict with the 35 minutes. If you go to the bathroom, it counts. If you have a sip of water, that counts. If something distracts you that's going on around you, like maybe you know, your friend or roommate or something or someone at the coffee shop, that counts. Because on test day, you might also have the proctors kind of circling around you or other test takers who are annoying. So keep all of that in mind as you do your timed exams. Elizabeth asks, felt good about all sections, but logic games. Thinking about retake, think about retaking it in November. Do you know if I'll be able to cancel the test in time to get a refund if I did okay today? What LSAC typically does, if you're already registered for an exam, is that they will let you withdraw from it and you can withdraw from it up to a few weeks before, I believe. You can also, no, you can withdraw to the day before. And in that case, I think you don't get any refund at all. If you postpone, a few weeks before, then they will 
not take all your money. They will let you pay, you know, they'll charge you some fee. That's maybe like a third or a quarter of what the registration fee is. And then you can apply that towards a future test date. You know, the b- bottom line is that they, they don't give you all your money back, but they give you some. So right now you will get none of your money back. If you withdraw close to the exam date, you will get some money back if you postpone. So the fee of course is just a drop in the bucket, but it is what it is in the grand scheme though. It's, you know, it's better to relatively better to register for an exam. If you're not sure whether you'll take it because the best test centers get booked up early. And of course the ones that are typically more centrally located get booked up earlier. And so you don't want to have to fly home to your parents or you don't want to have to do a long commute or rent a hotel room the night before just to be rel- you know, relatively and reasonably close to your exam center. You also want to Google for reviews so that you can register early for what the, the hive mind knows to be the best cent- test center possible. So yeah, register. I would say all else being equal, don't postpone or withdraw until you absolutely know or have to, because once you go one direction, you can't go back on that. So yeah, no food for thought there. Uh, Happy to take other questions about anything at all right now. How to decide whether to retake. So obviously if today didn't go well, you probably want to retake. But if you're on the fence about it, if you're unsure, You want to be thinking about what could you do differently next time to get the most out of your studying between now and the next exam or whenever you take it. So if you studied one way, you want to think about having it and taking a different approach. If you studied using random books off the, the bookstore shelves, and maybe those books don't use real LSAT questions or they contain errors of some kind, or they're published by a major prep company and not one of the smaller boutique options that tends to be more specialized. You might consider a whole new course of approach. You might consider getting more exams. Maybe you didn't study with all the most recent tests. And so changing your approach with the materials that you use is one thing you could do. You want to be using the newest exams, the most recent two or three books of 10 actual exams, and then any of the individual exams that follow. You want to be using books that have good reviews. You want to be using books that use real LSAT questions. And you want to be making, you want to make sure that you have enough time to study. So if you have been working a lot lately, or you have a busy course schedule, or other things have been coming up in your life, family, friends, other obligations, other priorities, you want to rethink what are those priorities? What, what could I do differently next time around? Could I get better materials? Could I invest more in those materials? Could I think more thoroughly about what I'm doing and why? Maybe you've been doing lots of timed exams and you have not been reviewing them in excruciating detail. One of the things I focus on in my courses is getting into the LSAT mindset because the LSAT mindset is what's going to allow you to get the most possible, most out, po- most out of your review as pass- possible. So think about analyzing everything that you have trouble with, everything you get wrong, everything you had difficulty with, everything you could have been approaching more efficiently, and fill notebooks with your review. That's the best way to get the most out of your study in the later stages when you're studying for a retake is excruciatingly detailed review. You also want to be thinking about better simulating test day. So maybe you took a lot of exams in the comfort of your own home, which is a fairly sterile environment. Maybe you weren't super strict with yourself on timing. Maybe you weren't giving yourself enough in the way of distractions. And maybe nerves or anxiety got the best of you. This is a major aspect of LSAT prep that most students don't pay enough attention to. It's why my newest course is on test day success, focusing on the test day mindset, properly simulating test day conditions, properly preparing for and dealing with all the fears and anxieties and doubts and self-limiting beliefs that come up. And so if you're interested in doing things differently next time around and finding a better course of approach, you might want to check out the the test day success course. Uh, 
The details on that are in the link below this video if you'd like to find out more. You also want to be thinking overall about how you could allocate your time and your schedule over the next few months until your next LSAT exam. So maybe you want to take a bit of time off work or at least in the lead up to the exam in the final week, you want to take a day or two off beforehand if you can. Maybe you want to talk with your boss and work fewer hours per week. Maybe you want to talk more with your with your family and friends and ask that they give you the, the space to spend more time studying and they take a load off you here and there where they can. So those are just some thoughts. Of course, I have schedules. I have, a, I have two schedules for retaking. One of them is just a general schedule that focuses on your week areas and timed exam. And the other one is a crazy, super intense schedule for people who are studying full time and want to do every exam ever released, which of course is nuts. And I wouldn't recommend doing all of those, but if you are changing your approach and part of that involves studying full time, you might want to check out the intense version of my retake schedule where I go into detail on that. And that's under books, uh, under schedules on my website. It's totally free. And so you can check that out as well. Uh, Elizabeth asks, self studying with 10 actual prep tests, how to best study the questions that I get, I get wrong. Where can I get explanations from? Great questions. So how to best study the questions you get wrong. That goes into a review, which I've talked about a bit. What I'll say more about that is it takes at, it takes more than five or even 10 minutes to properly review questions. You want to look in excruciating detail. And I say excruciating because this takes a long time. This is not just, oh, oh, I checked their correct answer. Oh, I kind of see how where they're coming from and how they how they're thinking and I get it now and you move on. You are maybe even before looking at the correct answer, you're attempting the problem again. And you are thinking to yourself, you're getting a new perspective. You're you've gotten some distance. You're changing your perspective. You're broken out of the tunnel vision so you, that you're able to see the question in a different way. And you're able to better understand the method of reasoning that they're using, if it's LR, for example. You're seeing if there's a more efficient approach and a different way you could have approached the question. For LR and RC in particular, you're looking at what was tempting about the wrong answer choice that made it wrong and what ultimately makes it wrong. So what was tempting, what made it wrong? For the correct answer, what was discouraging about it and what ultimately made it correct in the end? And you do this over and over and over. That's how you get the most out of your prep. You also don't do everything timed. A lot of students are, are especially drawn to doing full length timed exams, quickly checking their score, checking their results and moving on to the next one. I would rather you do fewer exams in more depth then do a greater number of exams and not cover them in as much detail. You also want a study program that has you build up bit by bit. So you're not doing just full length exams between now and your retake, if you're retaking. What you're doing is you're doing maybe a timed exam or two per week max, but you're also devoting a lot of time, the rest of your time really, to your week areas and analyzing those and also you're reviewing in detail the exams that you're taking. If you feel that you need to build a stronger foundation, then you want to use more foundational materials. And in that case, I'd, I would recommend my, my regular general courses where I cover each of the major sections and help you build the LSAT mindset that you need to later go on to the timed exams. But you wanna build the foundation first if you don't already have it. And so that involves doing questions by type untimed. You start there. In my schedules, I typically recommend you start with logic games, then layer on logical reasoning and finally reading comprehension. And that's because that's the general order in which the sections are most improvable, most easily improved upon rather. So you start with games, they're the lowest hanging fruit, you make your gains there. Then you build on LR because that's also fairly easy to improve upon and it's half the exam. Then finally, you do reading comp. Then you bring it all together with, with full-length timed exams and detailed review of those exams. And in between, of course, I weave, on, weave in doing timed sections. But you want to start doing untimed sections, untimed questions as well, 
by type so that you're building the foundation that you need to better understand the, the various question types. And if you're noticing trends in what you're having difficulty with and what you're getting wrong, then you have those weak areas to focus on and you can work on those specifically. So you're noticing weak areas and you're budgeting, budgeting in extra time to focus on those weak areas. And that could involve reading more articles from my site, reading chapters in various prep books and doing questions of those type more. I have a list of I have categorizations actually for all the sections on my site, the logical reasoning uh, section in particular, I have a lot of questions sorted by type. I have them sorted by questions, then type. And then even more specifically for sufficient assumption, I have subcategorized sufficient assumption questions by their formulas. And so if you go on my site under the logical reasoning section, you will see those and you can target those specifically. So check that out as well. I have games categorizations. I have reading comp as well, but I would say the LR specifically is pretty useful to focus on. However, remember that not everything is in the categorization by question stem for LR. A lot of it is also by method of reasoning. That's a different way to analyze the questions and the arguments in particular is what method of reasoning are they using? And thinking about it from that perspective is another thing that could more deeply inform your LSAT logical reasoning review. You were also asking about where to get explanations. I have explanations on my site for the vast majority of LSAT exams. There are also plenty of others. I have written ones you can check out under the books section. I also have free video explanations for logic games. And I'll be doing a lot more video material coming up. It won't necessarily focus on specific LSAT problem explanations, but it will focus on different question types. So that could be a valuable resource for you. But yeah, go to the books section of my site, click on explanations, or you could also go to free stuff. And uh, from Logic Games, I think you'll find all the videos there. So check those out. Also, of course, internet searching, you'll find plenty of forums and other resources. Um, my friend Graham has LSAT hacks which is a great website where he's put up a ton of free material. So check that out as well. Um, got one question here from Shireen. I had two reading comp sections and both sucked for me to the point where I think I have to cancel my score, even though I did pretty well on the other sections. So yeah, of course, one of those was the experimental section. We don't know which one. You might be able to figure that out by going on the forums. But I would say, unless it went disastrously for you, and unless you're 100% sure which one was the experimental, you may not want to cancel. Like I said earlier, you may have done better than you think. And of course, you don't want to risk canceling if that reading comp section that went poorly wasn't actually the experimental. So do some analysis, do some research, think it over. Don't decide now. You have six calendar days from the LSAT exam date to cancel. So there is no benefit to canceling now, especially when, of course, you're in the heat of the moment. You just, you just got out. You're concerned. You know, delay till tomorrow I, I, or the, ne the next day. I don't think you're likely to forget can to cancel. So don't do it now. I think they make you fax and fax it in there. Some things you may not even have access to a fax machine right now. So wait, see how, see how it goes. See how you think about it and feel. And then, of course, if you're planning to retake, focus on reading count. That's a section where students can improve quite a bit, but they don't always devote enough time to it because the other sections seem so much more forward. But LSAT reading comp is very different from reading comp on any other exam, certainly different from the SAT and the, and, uh, the GRE, for example. So make sure that you devote some time to reading comp. Got another question here. Is a drill set available for specific reading comp question types? Yes, there is. You can go on Amazon and search LSAT questions by type. They, uh, there are books out there categorizing them by, you know, by section. So you have a book devoted to games, reasoning, reading comp. You also then have them sorted within those books by game type or question type or section type. So go on Amazon. There are some that are still in print. There are some uh, folks who used to publish these and they lost their licenses. 
And so they're not available brand new necessarily, but the nice thing is that they're available used. And a lot of those are much more affordable than the ones that are still in print because people aren't always digging the depth of depths of Amazon. So search around there. There's um, some good ones and make sure of course, that if you get a used one that there's no writing in it. So check that out. There's none available in PDF, uh, unfortunately, because LSAC has banned PDF distribution. They got worried about piracy. So none digitally, but you can get them in print or not used on Amazon. So make sure that you take a look at those. They're less useful than people think because like I was speaking about for LR in particular, that question type based on the question stem is not always the most useful way to think about the LSAT. A lot of times it's the method of reasoning that determines whether you get a question right or wrong. If there's a confusing method of reasoning, then that may be the reason you get it wrong, even though you're good at a given question type. So analyze in your review process methods of reasoning. A lot of times it's apparent with flaw questions that, of course, it's one flaw or another. If it's correlation causation versus necessary versus sufficient assumptions, or it's about, it's about something like numbers and percentages or absolute versus relative terms. Or maybe it's about the abstract nature of the answer choices and how they're worded. And so the reason you need to review a question is not simply because of the question stem, but rather because of cert a certain attribute, other attribute of the question. So think about that as well, analyze that as well. Of course, if you have trouble with science passages in particular, you don't jumping to read and comp for a moment, a moment, you don't need to necessarily do the passages by that type. You can simply, you have all your exams already, just pay special attention to the science oriented ones and focus on those. With games, of course, they're useful, uh, maybe most so out of all the sections, but there's also plenty of categorizations published online. I, I've certainly published mine. And so you can just, if you have the exams, you can just jump around exam by exam and you can handpick the ones that you need to do at that moment in time. I have in my schedules, I categorize for you. You're certainly for games, it's in, in the schedule for logical reasoning, it's on the website. And so you can use those sorts of categorizations as well. You don't need to, need to necessarily get a whole new book just for that reason. Yeah, other questions? Uh, guys, shoot. Uh, Shireen says, you're right, I think I devoted more time to logic games and it made off okay, but I guess I, I'm not enough for reading comprehension. So yeah, I would say if you're planning to retake over the next few months, just do a timed logic game section here or there, maybe over the next, you know, once a week, once a week or so, just to stay fresh on reading comp, but then balance your studying more in favor of more logical reasoning, more reading comp. And there are, at this point, something like nearly 100 exams released between the ones that are numbered and the ones that are not. So you have plenty of practice, practice material available to you, and you don't need to go beyond that. People ask about reading The Economist or something like that. And yeah, it's, it's great. If we could go back in time to you know, five years ago, I could tell you, yeah, read The Economist for the next four years and then spend a year gradually studying for the LSAT bit by bit. That would be awesome. But if you enjoy that sort of thing, yeah, read, read it for fun. But at this point, if you're studying for the LSAT in the next few months or even the next year, your time is better spent on reading the hundreds of published, released LSAT passages that you have available to yourself and analyzing them in detail, especially everything you get wrong or have difficulty with using process of elimination and getting more comfortable with choosing choices that you don't fully understand. So use that to orient your studying. Um, got a question. Why don't they disclose answers to certain exams? Yeah. So certain exams are not released. Other ones are, and there often seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. Well, the reason is that they administer the LSAT, more often than they want to have to create new exams. 
and release them. So if they release a given exam, they can't use that one again because people will have studied from it. So it's a way for them to kind of cheat and reuse stuff they already made, which makes sense if you think about it. It's the exams are super, these questions are insanely complex. And my, my friend who used to write LSAT questions, he would tell me that every question he would submit to them, you know, he would submit 10, they would choose like one. So it's a lot of work to write enough questions for all the times they administer, they administer the LSAT. They used to administer it only four times a year with official exams. Then of course there were like the Sabbath observers, there were the overseas ones, they're the ones where they have to wait a few weeks because of the oh, extreme weather, uh, a, a hurricane or a, a snowstorm might lead them to have to cancel and then re-administer administer it a few weeks later. So they, and then now there's, they're upping the number of exams they administer. Now they're doing it you know, six times a year, eight times a year. They're going to move it to 10 times a year and they don't want to have to produce uh, you know, more than 12 exams a year. So they're reusing content and there's something weird about that that happens now where you could be a Sabbath observer who took the LSAT last year and they didn't release that one, but now they're reusing that today. And if they release today's exam, then people who took both are going to see that. And that's not a good thing. So for that reason, it's getting to the point where there might have slight overlap where a small number of people are seeing that content from you know their previous unreleased exam to their later released one but it's not really a big deal because people probably aren't going to remember it that well if you look across six months or a year or two years but it's still not the best situation i'm hoping that lsac will devote a bit more money and more effort to producing more original lsat content so that you don't run into this issue but that's really the reason that, that they don't point blank by default, just release every single exam, because then they would be, be producing something like 20 exams a year. And they may not want to go to that level of scale. Something interesting with the GMAT is that because the GMAT is computerized, they don't release every GMAT because the GMAT is an adaptive exam where they it's different for every person every single time. And they adapt it based on you and which questions you're getting right or wrong. So they have a, a set of like thousands of questions. And all they do is every couple of years or so, I think they will release a new official guide that contains a bunch of questions, but not every question. And the thing with the GMAT is that they can just insert new numbers into math problems and they're not recognizable. But with a game or a reading comp passage, of course, they do need to create it pretty much from scratch. With reading comp, of course they do, but with games, there are some games that actually are so similar to each other where they just changed certain small things and those are released. And if you want an example of that, you can look at my website, Seven Logic Games Repeated on Future, on future Prep Tests. And I listed games where they basically just changed the variables and certain small details, but they did actually reuse most of the structure. And so that's an interesting thing to see. Uh, yeah, enough on that. Another, another one. Why don't they disclose tests to people, uh, to tests that are held outside the U.S. and Canada as we don't get to see our wrong and right answers? Pretty much for the same reason they won't release certain test dates overall. It's because they've got to reuse them. Another question. Will they break it down for you if it's unreleased? Will they break down which sections, for example? Let's say, did you get 10 wrong on games and five wrong on each LR or something like that. Unfortunately, no. If your exam is unreleased, they're barely telling you anything. They're telling you your score and that's it. So unfortunately, you don't get any of the details about which how you did per section, which is a shame because there's no reason they couldn't tell you that without spoiling anything or releasing any sensitive information. The fact that you got three wrong on games is not going to affect the integrity of the exam. But so far, they haven't. LSAC is becoming nicer and friendlier and as you know, with the new administration. And so for that reason, that may change going forward. Maybe they'll even surprise us all and do that for this exam. But so far, we have no reason to believe that will be the case. So we'll see what happens. Uh, 
I'm get, my guess is that they won't, which is unfortunate, but chances are for anyone taking an unreleased exam, you're just getting the score itself. But again, like I said, it would have been an, of relatively limited usefulness anyway, because you no one exam is, an, is a fully accurate representation of where you stand. You really need a, a set of five in order to know. So I would say, if you want to know where you stand, take some other exam you haven't seen now and see how that went. See what you did per section and make it as realistic as possible. You could have a friend proctor you, or you could even go to one of the free exams proctored by a major prep company that they're regularly offering. Like Kaplan, Kaplan and Princeton Review tend to do that pretty often. And you can go there and that'll be a bit more strict and a better indication of how you might do under real world conditions. Do I know if the answer is moving away from paper and pencil? Is the LSAT changing to a digital format? The answer is yes. They are moving. They have been studying this, you know, quote unquote, studying very slowly for years. And it turns out that they are actually speeding up on that process. They've been testing out, you taking, you're know, giving the LSAT on a tablet, specifically a, a Samsung, and They've piloted that. There are they're right now at the moment they're doing pilots where they're giving a handful of students the opportunity to actually take the LSAT in a, on tablet, and that will probably go into full effect as a as an option alongside paper and pencil next year. I read a report about that. So in 2019 they'll be giving people both options, and then moving forward they'll probably they might make it the default for all I know. They might you know let's say in 2020, 2021, they might actually shift so that everyone is taking it on tablet and no one is doing it paper and pencil. So far, reports of the tablet experience are not that positive, unfortunately. There is something extremely important, it turns out, about doing things by hand on paper, being able to cross things out physically, especially think about for games or for other sections, maybe you want to underline or circle something and you want, maybe you want to cross off A, B, C, D, E, and the tablet certainly limits your ability to do that. And of course, all the materials now are in paper and pencil format, unless you're using a PDF or something like that. But there is something extremely important about the physical experience. And that's why, especially for while it's still in the current paper and pencil format, you want to be practicing that way. So. If you're doing practice problems on screen, it's not a good experience when your actual LSAT is going to be different than that. You want to be able to cross off all five choices. You want to be able to underline or circle certain things. You want to be able to draw diagrams. And maybe you want to draw diagrams not just for games, but also for certain formulaic logical reasoning questions. And so if you can't do that, that's not good. So orient all your practice with paper and pencil if you're using digital LSATs, print them out. When things change such that the tablet option is the only option, then of course that will change the nature of studying a great deal. Then I'm sure that various LSAT prep providers and po probably even LSAT themselves will offer a digital LSAT experience for practice where you know, right now the, they give you a free sample LSAT as a PDF. In the future, they may take that same exam or hopefully a newer one and put that in digital form where you can walk through it on desktop and on tablet. You know, personally, I think the desktop is probably a more comfortable experience because that's what I spend more of my time using. But if they make it tablet only, then we're all going to have to get tablets and use those which may have a, a quality of opportunity issue because not everyone owns a tablet. And so that's something, not everyone owns a disk, desktop either for that matter, but they're certainly more common, I would, I would expect. So we will see what happens. Um, I'm hoping that they offer both or that they still offer paper and pencil for as long as possible. It's better from that, their perspective probably to offer it on a digital format if that would allow them to offer the LSAT more frequently. Like the GMAT is offered virtu virtually every weekday. I think that the LSAT will certainly move towards being more frequent and eventually long run, they may also do the format where they don't release numbered exams forever. 
and we're going to get into the hundreds at this point at this rate and rather they'll just have a set of like 5,000 or 20,000 questions that they draw upon randomly. I'm hoping that they don't uh, do a to things totally in, in an adaptive format because that would be tougher to replicate when you're practicing, but we'll see what happens. I'm excited that things are changing and they're becoming more student friendly at the very least though. Other questions, what else is on your mind? What else is going on for you guys? What's stressing you out? What are your test day stories and test day concerns? Uh, anyone still unsure about canceling? Anyone I'm still unsure about whether they should retake? Got one question here. I'm only able to study for 10 to 15 hours a week. I'm in school and I have a busy course load. How should I balance everything? Oh, that's a great question. So if you have limited time to study, what do you do? Well, first of all, I would say if you have limited time to study, you want to be thinking about how to structure your time. You want to be waking up early consistently. You want to get on a regimen where you're carving out time in your schedule on a weekly and daily basis. So if I were in your shoes, I would structure my schedule something like that, like this. I would think of the LSAT as two courses put together, like an a six credit course or an eight credit course. And I would carve out time in my schedule every day or two where I'm blocking out two to three hours consistently. And maybe that's first thing in the morning before you get distracted with other obligations. Maybe it's on the weekend more so on a day when you don't have classes. Maybe you are orienting your course load such that you're doing your other, cor your other courses because the LSAT is a course for you later in the day so that you're doing your LSAT studying first when you're most awake and most fresh. If you're working full time and can only fit it in after working on the weekends, you want to carve out time there as well. So maybe you wake up extra early, you get to the office extra early, and you spend a few hours there, at least one or two, before everyone else comes in. If you can't study at work, you study at a coffee shop nearby or you find a library nearby that opens weirdly early or based on your work schedule might be an issue, but try to find a spot that's not your house and knock it out of the way first. That's the best way to make sure it actually happens. Make it a priority and use a, a strict schedule for yourself. Of course, I have schedules on my site in particular, the day-by-day -day ones are especially useful for students, but my week-by-week -week student, my, day by, my daily schedule would involve ideally if you can carve out the time is before work or at least in the morning, during lunchtime, after work or later in the day for a couple hours, and then give yourself the rest of the day, the evening in particular to relax, to do everything else in your life that's important to you. Because if you do LSAT study when you're extremely tired, you run the risk of not getting the most out of your studying. And you don't want, there's, not, there's nothing worse really than to do several hours of study and not get a lot out of it. So you're much better off if you do the studying when you're fresh and in with a clear head so that you're actually seeing the progress and getting results out of the work that you're doing. It's better to be tired when you're watching Netflix or tired when you have a course that's not the most important to you or tired just you know, before bed during your wind down. That's okay. But Doing a time section when your brain's already fried from everything else in the day is not ideal. So I would say orient your schedule accordingly and have a plan for yourself. Don't just have your, your plan be whatever you feel like doing that day or based on how you're doing that day. You want to at least have a, a goal that you're aiming at. And if you don't study all three hours, but you fit in two to two and a half, that's still pretty good too. So be happy about that. Got one more here. This is, this is, this is going to be the last one for today. Uh, if I cancel this exam, how do you recommend I study for November? I've been studying for over a year and I need a little bit of time away after a few weeks of rigorous study. Yeah, that's totally fine. Take off this weekend. Take off the next week if you want, if you've been pushing yourself really hard. Instead, use this time to relax to reorient yourself, anything else that may, may have been slipping by the wayside, take time to make that right, whatever it is. And then from there, come up with a new plan of attack. Maybe you use a new study plan. Maybe you use a new course. Maybe you get different books. 
maybe you schedule your life in a different way. You orient your study if you already have a strong foundation by focusing on your weak areas, some time devoted to weak areas, some time devoted to full length exams or time sections if you can't do a full exam on a given day, but you still wanna do something. And identify what your weak areas are. Look back at your recent exams, the most recent five to 10, and analyze those by question type, analyze those by their method of reasoning, and focus on analyzing them in detail as I've discussed, as well as arming yourself with the right resources that you need to get the most out of that prep. So if you haven't gotten all the explanations you need or you haven't gotten all the guides you need, then make sure you get you, what you need, whatever it is. I have plenty of explanations and guides and other resources on my, on my website to check out. And if something did not go well about test day in particular today, whether nerves or anxiety kicked in or you did not simulate it as fully as possible, consider getting my new test day success course. There's a link to it in the description below this video. And that really goes over all the nuts and bolts of what you need to be doing differently. Also consider the test day checklist because I that, that covers all the little items and details that you might not have thought of this time around. So see what you could be doing differently Make sure that you don't that you aren't missing anything in your prep and hold yourself accountable. Have a plan. And if that plan involves taking off the next few days or the next week, totally fine. But make sure that you're also budgeting for whatever else might come up between now and then. So if any major holidays are coming up, any major life events, if you're in school and you might be having midterms between now and then, focus on that. So have a plan. Think about this all now rather than in the final week before your exam. And don't just do exams you know, randomly, bit by bit, and get so focused on the spreadsheets and all the tracking. Really focus on the structure of what you're doing and have a reason for why you're doing it. So that's about all for today, guys. Thank you all for coming. I hope that the exam went well and that the next few weeks are not too excruciating for you. Over the next few weeks, Use it productively, take a break, but focus on your applications, your personal statement, letters of rec, and making a plan for what you'll do differently next time around if you do have to retake and you make that choice for yourself. So it was great catching up with you all, all you guys, and keep in touch. I will likely do another session like this on score release day. So keep an eye out for that. And until then, all the best to you guys. Take care and thanks for coming.